Welcome back, my YouTube channel subscribers, to Big Bill Anderson's Death Tours. Today I am here in Phoenix, Arizona at 2929 North 2nd Street. And I'm going to tell you a story about the house that's right here behind me. On the night of October 16th, 1931, 88 years ago, this house became infamous in national headlines when two roommates, Agnes Ann Leroy and her roommate Hedvig Sammy Samuelson were both murdered by another former roommate, Winnie Ruth Judd. This case made national headlines. Winnie Ruth Judd became known after that as the trunk murderess because Samuelson was cut up into parts and put into three different trunks and suitcases Leroy was put into another trunk, and Winnie Root Judd then transported all those luggages, baggages, with her on a train from Phoenix to Los Angeles, where depot employees smelled a foul odor coming from the trunks. Eventually, Winnie was captured she admitted to the crimes. It's a very complicated story. I'm going to tell you all about it, show you a lot of pictures, been to all the sites involving this case around Phoenix. And I just want you to stay with me. We'll get in depth about this. The trunk murderess in Phoenix. Winnie Ruth Winnie McKinnell Ruth was Judd. born on January 29th, 1905, to the Reverend H.J. McKinnell, a Methodist minister and his wife, Carrie, in Oxford, Indiana. At age 17, she married Dr. William C. Judd, a World War I veteran, more than 20 years her senior, and moved to Mexico. William was reportedly a morphine addict as a result of war injuries and had difficulty keeping a job, forcing the couple to move frequently and live on uncertain income. The marriage was further strained by Winnie's health problems and inability to bear children. By 1930, the couple were mostly living separately, although they remained in constant communication. Judd, called by her middle name Ruth, moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where she worked as a governess to a wealthy family. During that time, she met John J. Happy Jack Halloran, a 44-year-old Phoenix businessman who was active in the city's political and social circles. Although married, Halloran was a known playboy and philanderer. Judd and Halloran became friendly and eventually had an extramarital affair. I guess it helped that Halloran lived next door to where Winnie was staying and started his flirtations on the front porch of the house that Winnie was living in. After a few months, Judd began working as a secretary at the Grunau Medical Clinic in Phoenix. There she met Agnes Ann Leroy, an x-ray technician, and her roommate, Hedvig Sammy Samuelson, who had moved together from Alaska after Samuelson contracted tuberculosis. The two women were also friendly with Halloran. Judd became friends with Leroy and Samuelson and even moved in with them for a couple of months into this house so. in 1931. But differences developed between the women and Judd soon returned to her own apartment, located just a short distance from the rented bungalow shared by Leroy and Samuelson. At the time of the murders, Judd was 26 years old, Leroy 32, and Samuelson 24. According to police, on the night of October 16, 1931, Leroy and Samuelson were murdered by Judd after an alleged fight among the three women over Jack Halloran's affections. The prosecution at Judd's murder trial would suggest that quarrels over men and the relationship between Leroy and Samuelson broke up the friendship of the three women and that jealousy was the motive for the killings. 
The two victims were killed with a 25 caliber handgun. According to prosecutors, Judd and an accomplice then dismembered Samuelson's body and put the head, torso, and lower legs into a black shipping trunk, placing the upper legs in a beige smaller bag and, and hat box. Leroy's body was stuffed intact into a second black shipping trunk. Two days after the murder on Sunday, October 18, 1931, Judd, with her left hand bandaged from a gunshot wound, boarded the Golden State Limited passenger train from Phoenix's Union Station, along with the trunks and luggage containing the bodies. Judd traveled overnight to Los Angeles, California. Upon her arrival at 7.45 a.m. the next morning, the trunks immediately came under suspicion because of the foul odor detected by station personnel, as well as fluids escaping from the trunks. Thinking at first the trunks contained contraband, the baggage agent, Arthur W. Anderson, wanted them opened and tagged them to be held. He asked Judd for the key, but she stated she didn't have it with her. Burton McKennell, Judd's brother and a junior at the University of Southern California, picked her up from the train station, unaware of the murders or the bodies. Judd departed with her brother, leaving her trunks behind. At around 4.30 p.m. that afternoon, station personnel called the Los Angeles Police Department to report the suspicious trunks. After picking the locks of each trunk, the police discovered the bodies. Meanwhile, Burton had dropped his sister off somewhere in Los Angeles, where she proceeded to disappear. Judd hid out for several days until she surrendered to police in a funeral home the following Friday, October 23, 1931. The murder became headline news across the country with the press calling Judd the Tiger Woman. Eventually, the case came to be known in the media as the Trunk Murders and Judd as the Trunk Murderess. On the evening of Monday, October 19, 1931, Phoenix police first entered the bungalow where Leroy and Samuelson had resided. Neighbors and reporters were also allowed in and destroyed the original integrity of the crime scene. The following day, the bungalow's landlord placed newspaper ads in the Arizona Republic and the Phoenix Evening Gazette offering tours of the three-room home for 10 cents per person, attracting hundreds of curiosity seekers. During the trial, Judd's defense protested, stating, by the advertisements in the newspapers, the entire population of Maricopa County visited that place. The police maintained that Judd's victims were shot while asleep in their beds. The mattresses from the two beds were missing the night the police entered. One mattress was later found with no blood stains on it miles away in a vacant lot. The other remained missing. No explanation was ever offered as to why one was found so far away, nor what became of the other mattress. Judd's trial began on January 19, 1932 at the Maricopa County Courthouse with Judge Howard C. Speakman presiding. The dismemberment aspect of the double slain was never addressed in court because Judd was tried only for the murder of Leroy, whose body was not dismembered. She was never tried for the murder of Hedvig Samuelson. The state argued that Judd acted with premeditation, that the relationship between the three women had deteriorated over some weeks, and they had argued over the affections of Halloran, all of which culminated in the murders. The prosecution maintained that Judd had herself inflicted the gunshot wound to her left hand to try to bolster her claim of self-defense. Judd's defense contended that she was innocent because she was insane, but did not introduce the self-defense argument for the record 
and Judd did not take the stand in her own defense. The jury found Judd guilty of the first-degree murder of Leroy on February 8, 1933. An appeal was unsuccessful. Judd was sentenced by Judge Speakman to be hanged February 17, 1933, and sent to Arizona State Prison in Florence, Arizona. However, her death sentence was overturned after a 10-day hearing found her mentally incompetent. Judd was then sent to the Arizona State Asylum for the Insane on April 24, 1933. The state's only mental institution was in Phoenix. The name was eventually changed to the Arizona State Hospital. When it was discovered during the course of the trial that Halloran and Judd had been involved in an illicit affair, Halloran came under suspicion of complicity in the killings. He was indicted by a grand jury as an accomplice to murder on December 30, 1932. A preliminary hearing on the charge against Halloran was held in mid-January 1933 and Judd appearing as the star witness. In testimony that lasted almost three days, an emotional Judd told her story saying, I am going to be hanged for something Jack Halloran is responsible for. I was convicted of murder, but I shot in self-defense. Jack Halloran removed every bit of evidence. He is responsible for me going through all of this. He is guilty of anything that I am guilty of. Judd testified she had gone to Leroy and Samuelson's bungalow on an invitation to play bridge, and a fourth woman, who had also been invited, had already left. She testified that the, there was an argument about Judd's introduction of Halloran to another woman, and that she killed Leroy and Samuelson in self-defense after they physically attacked her. According to Judd, she met up with Halloran shortly after the killings and returned with him to the bungalow. After seeing the bodies, he went to the garage and returned with a great heavy trunk and told her not to tell anyone. Under cross-examination, Judd admitted repacking Samuelson's dismembered body in a trunk and other luggage two days after the murders when she was back at her apartment. Halloran did not take the stand in his own defense. His attorney told the court that Judd's story was nothing more than the story of an insane person and argued that since she had testified that the two women were killed in self-defense, there was, in fact, no crime committed. Therefore, Halloran could not be tried for anything. Halloran's attorney then asked for the charges against his client to be dismissed. On January 25, 1933, the judge freed Halloran, saying that the state's case was inconsistent and that trying him would be an idle gesture. Although officially exonerated, Halloran eventually fell out of favor in Phoenix, losing his business associates and social status. He died in Tucson in 1939. Judd escaped from the Arizona State Hospital six times between 1933 and 1963, in one instance walking all the way to Yuma, Arizona along the old Southern Pacific Railroad tracks, which is 185 miles. Judd escaped for the final time on October 8, 1963 using a key to the front door of the hospital that a friend had given her. She ended up in the San Francisco Bay Area where she became a live-in maid for a wealthy family, living in a mansion overlooking the bay using the name Marion Lane. After six years, her identity in California was eventually discovered and she was taken back to Arizona on August 18, 1969. Judd was paroled and released, was released on December 22, 1971. 
In 1983, the state of Arizona issued her an absolute discharge, meaning she was no longer a parolee. Judd moved to Stockton, California, where she died on October 23, 1998, at the age of 93, 67 years to the day from her surrender to the LAPD in 1931. Winnie was laid to rest at Inglewood Park Cemetery, and I visited her grave, along with my son, Audie, on July 15, 2016. And sometime in the next couple of years, I do plan on visiting the final resting place for Hedvig Samuelson, who is buried at Crystal Lake Cemetery in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and also Agnes Leroy, who is buried at Evergreen Memorial Park Cemetery in McMinnville, Oregon. These two ladies were brutally murdered, whether it is by Winnie Ruth Judd or Jack Halloran or whatever other accomplice was involved in this. It is extremely sad that these Two beautiful young women were so tragically taken uh, from their potential future in life. So I do plan on going to their graves. Through the years, I have been very interested in this murder case. And I am now going to take you and show you some of the photos I have taken through the years uh, involving this case. Uh, first, I'll show you a couple of photos I took at Jack Halloran's house outside across the street. And after that, I'll show you the house next door where he seduced Winnie Ruth Judd on the porch of this house. I guess it helped that Winnie was a a uh, very pretty young girl at 25, and Jack was quite a bit older and married, and he saw Winnie sitting on the porch at this house as she was working as a governess at this house. So he took advantage of the situation, and I guess uh, Winnie became quite infatuated with him, and I'll show you. Here are some photos that I took at the Grunau Clinic. I went inside just to get a glimpse of this historic building that uh, has been in Phoenix for many, many years. And this is where Anne Leroy worked along with Winnie Ruth Judd, and that's where Winnie met Anne Leroy and then eventually met Hedvig Samuelson. So here are some photos inside that building. And here are a couple of pictures that I had taken at the old Phoenix Union Station, Railroad Station, that is no longer used, but I had to stop by there and record a couple photos there also. Winnie Ruth Judd's apartment building that she lived in at the time of these murders has since been torn down, and I'll show you what the area looks like where her apartment building used to stand as well as a photo of uh, her manager from her apartment letting the press go into her apartment and showing which apartment was hers at the building on Brill Street in Phoenix, where a hospital parking lot now sits. And also through the years I have stopped by in front of this house and while people were living there and taking pictures outside of the house. Again, it was my infatuation with the case. And I always uh, wanted to stop and knock on the door and ask somebody to look inside that house, but I never did out of respect, of course. But here are a few photos that I had taken through the years of this house uh, before its current incarnation, which Right now it is being renovated because an attorney has bought this house and salvaged it from the uh, from demolition. Uh, also, at some point in the future, when the attorney that has bought this house completes the renovation, 
I do plan on going inside and attempting to videotape inside the rooms uh, that were involved in this case, which uh, would be the bedroom, which will be an office, I'm sure, at this point uh, uh, when the renovation is done. You can see into the windows there, uh, there's all kinds of wood and, and things stacked up inside. They're still uh, finishing uh, the inside of this building. So I will take you on the inside of that. But I'm not done explaining this case at all, too. Uh, now I'm going to show you a series of photos mm -hmm. uh, that I took at the uh, Pinal County uh, Museum of History in Florence, Arizona. Uh, these are all items that Winnie Ruth Judd uh, made, and they have them on display there. She made some uh, stuffed animals and that sort of thing inside uh, the Florence prison when she was there. And so I'm going to show you uh, those items and the display case. I was actually amazed that they had these items and they had saved them through the years. Uh, I guess showing just the macabre, darker side of Arizona history and the, and the case of the Winnie Ruth Judd trunk murderous case. Investigative journalist Jana Bombersback re-examined Judd's case for a series of articles in the Phoenix New Times paper and later book, The Trunk Murderess, Winnie Ruth Judd in 1993. As part of her investigation, Bombersback interviewed Judd herself. While Bombersback concluded that the police and prosecution were biased against Judd, her conclusions and her objectivity in view of her personal relationship she formed with Judd have been questioned by others who have studied the case. According to Bombersbach, due to Phoenix's small population in 1931, members of the police knew Holleran well and were aware, well aware of his associates, friends, and all of his girlfriends. Some police officers also knew the victims. Some even believed that Judd hadn't killed anyone, even in self-defense, but was only covering up for Halloran and possibly others. Halloran's release was considered by some to be a miscarriage of justice and his exoneration a political cover-up. His gray Packard had been spotted at the crime scene the night of the murders and again the next day, suggesting that he might have been an accomplice. Also, according to Bombersbach, there were indications that Judd was not capable of dismembering Samuelson's body, a task that, according to autopsy photos, was performed with surgical skills that Judd did not possess, and that Judd was not even physically capable of lifting the bodies. Bombersbach also suggested that a second gun might have been involved based on newspaper reports that Leroy was shot with a larger caliber bullet. Addressing the possibility that a person who possessed surgical skills dissected Samuelson's body, Bombersbach wrote about a nurse named Ann Miller, whom she interviewed for her book. Miller stayed, stated that while she was working at the Arizona State Hospital in 1936, Judd had confided to her that Dr. Brown had come to see her while she was in prison and told her he was going to confess everything. Later, after Miller told a Phoenix attorney of Judd's story, he stated, I'm sure she told you that. Dr. Brown came to my office and wanted to tell me the whole story. He made an appointment for the next week, but he died the day before the appointment. Brown died in June of 1932 of heart disease at the age of 44. According to Bombersbach, some speculate he might have been contemplating suicide, writing, as the New York Mirror reported the day Halloran's indictment was announced, a second man would probably have been indicted, according to widespread rumor, if death had not intervened. Mrs. Judd's story concluded that the declaration that a physician who has since committed suicide was summoned to the murder bungalow to aid in the disposal of the bodies. 
Also, according to Bombersbach, Winnie always maintained that the altercation between herself, Leroy, and Samuelson took place entirely in the kitchen and not in the bedroom, as police speculated. The historic Orpheum Theater in Phoenix, Arizona, was raising money for its restoration in 1997, and Jana Bombersbach bought two bricks outside of the theater, one in her name and the other for Winnie Ruth Judd on her 92nd birthday. Bombersbach brought Winnie Ruth Judd back to Phoenix for, the, for her first trip back in years and showed her the bricks outside the building. And they posed for a couple of photos. Of course, I had to go there myself and take a couple of photos. And here they are, my friends. So, the 2014 discovery of a so-called confession letter written in April of 1933 in Judd's own handwriting to her attorney, H.G. Richardson, raised new questions about her case. In the letter, which Judd called her first and only confession, she stated that she alone planned and carried out the murder of Leroy, with whom she was allegedly competing for Halloran's affections. She further stated that she had not planned to kill Samuelson, but did so after Samuelson, alerted by a gunshot that killed Leroy, walked in on the murder scene and began fighting with Judd. Judd wrote that she also acted alone in handling and transporting the bodies. According to a New Times article by Robert Pila, Richardson suppressed the letter because it contradicted the substance of an appeal he had just filed in her case. After Richardson's death, Judd wrote to his widow repeatedly asking for return of the letter for fear it would jeopardize hearings on her sanity and potential release from the Arizona State Mental Hospital, but Richardson's widow refused. In 2002, a few years after Judd's death, the letter was anonymously donated to the Arizona State Archives. The trunk murders were featured in a 2009 episode of a true crime television series, Deadly Women, entitled Hearts of Darkness, Season 3, Episode 6. There have been many books written about the case. Here are a few of the titles. I purposely left out the photos of Hedvig Samuelson's dismembered body parts in this video. I thought just talking about it was gruesome enough. You are more than welcome to see the photos for yourself if you do a Google search. It seems that Jack Halloran had Winnie Ruth Judd and other women in the palm of his hand. The case is hard to really get down to the truth, other than three women's lives were altered forever because of love jealousy and infatuation okay my friends if you were able to make it through this entire video my hat is off to you my friends I know this is a long video there's a lot of information here involving Winnie Ruth Judd and this house that's right behind me you know as you can clearly see here the neighborhood has changed it's totally unrecognizable compared to how it looked in 1931 there's high-rises all over there's condominiums there's parking structures nice big tall buildings this is what progress does to a city so my friends, I hope you enjoyed this video. I understand it was very long, but whenever I tried to omit something, I felt like it was pertinent to the story, and I just felt like it needed to be said. So, 
If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and uh, hit the uh, notification bell. Subscribe to my channel. It's greatly appreciated. My friends, we're growing onward and upward. Thank you to all my new subscribers. So very important to me and my big heart. Thank you very much. And this is Big Bill Anderson's Death Tour saying adios amigos.